So this message is more scriptures, please. I'm just probably going to hit all the points that Don said not to do this morning. But um, I did this before he did that. It's a scary honor to be in this class and to learn with you all how to preach and teach. It's scary because most of you know more about it than I do, and you're going to be grading me. So, but anyway, um, the question we need to answer about preaching is, what is the purpose of preaching? Now, there are two goals we should always have in mind. In fact, if I could, I'd have them tattooed on the inside of my eyelids so that every time I blink, I would see them. Goal number one is to inspire us to greater faith in God. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Our second goal is to persuade our listeners to live their lives in accordance with God's word and be transformed into a spotless holy bride for the Lord. Now the Apostle Paul wrote to, Tim to Timothy, who was his son in the faith, in 2 Timothy 4, chapters, verses 1 to 4, he says, I therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, charge you, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned to fables. We are in that time now. That's happening. There's a whole cadre. When you look on the internet, there's a whole bunch of preachers that have got some really weird, flaky ideas. In fact, there's some good Christian women that would almost be willing to kill if they could get their pie crust to be that flaky. <laughs> <laughs> we need more of the word and less of witty stories, yeah. anecdotes, and man's wisdom in our preaching. You remember back in Genesis where God created everything? And he just said things like, light be. Yeah. And there it was. I mean, he had it all figured out. The wavelengths, the color spectrums, you know, everything. And he just said, let it be. There's power in the words of God. Yeah. Great power. Life-changing power. Right. So here's a few verses about the word. In Psalm 119, verse 111, David says, Your word I have hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against you. So the word of God is a defense against sin. Jeremiah 23, 29. Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? God's word has power and force in our life. Yeah. And sometimes, there have been times where I've been reading the word. And... It just hits me. Just, you know, just pleasure reading and you're, you're just reading along in some book and all of a sudden something just jumps out and grabs you. Yeah. Sometimes it brings you to tears. Yeah. 
Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It's a flashlight that shines in front of us so we can see where we're going. It's also the street light at the end of the block so you know which way to head. His word gives us wisdom and helps us make good decisions. We said we hope it does. Isaiah 55 verses 10 and 11. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and they do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God's word. Now there's a there's a little plant in eastern Washington. I don't know about I haven't seen it over here. But it's called a stick tight. If you've ever gone hunting in eastern Washington, I remember one year went over with my brother in laws and we were duck hunting. In the, in the potholes by the Moses Lake. And as we were walking up to this particular pothole, we walked through this field of low bushes. And my nice, new, green, fuzzy wool pants, <laughs> it was supposed to be real quiet. <laughs> yeah. I went in wearing green pants and I came out wearing brown pants. <laughs> and they were covered in stick tights. Yeah. And, and if you didn't know, stick tight was the inspiration for Velcro. Yes. <laughs> so That's I cool. had That's about cool. an hour picking these things <laughs> off my pants. Yeah. Uh. So I could go walk through them again. <laughs> <laughs> but God's word is like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a stick tight. It will stick to you. Yeah. It will mm -hmm. stick in your spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Let's look at some things that Jesus said about the word. When he, you remember the story? He went to John and was baptized, and the heavens opened, and the Lord spoke to him. And then the scripture says he was driven into the wilderness by the Spirit of God, where he was tempted for forty days and nights. And every time that's recorded that the devil came to Jesus to tempt him in some way, he always answered with the word of God. Yep. Matthew chapter four and verse four says, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that pro proceeds from the mouth of God. God's word is not only life-sustaining food, but it defeats the devil at the same time. Matthew 24, verse 35, Jesus says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. His word from 2,000 years ago, still good today. So we can use it, we can preach it, we can teach it. Because the important thing are those two goals. To inspire faith and to inspire transformation in the lives of our listeners. Now here's kind of a negative verse. John 12, 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Jesus' words will be the standard by which we are judged. <clears throat> it won't be the laws of men. It won't be the rules of the church. It won't be by the Revised Code of Washington or the U.S. Code of Justice. It's going to be the word of God. 
that's going to be the standard, the, the plumb line, if you will, that we are looked at to see if our life is level or not. So our calling, our job, our task is to per pers persuade and prepare our listeners to live according to God's word in faith so that they are ready on that day when they stand before the Lord. There's an old saying that says, the best way to prepare to meet your God is to live with him every day so that when you see him face to face, it won't be anything out of the normal. Mm -hmm. mm. Amen. Good work. So I want to leave you with a recommendation and a challenge for your preaching. I challenge you to set yourself a rule that you will include lots of scriptures in your messages and ask the Lord how many should that be Lord you know I've heard preachers in days gone by who've taken one scripture and talked for an hour could have been done in five minutes So it's important that we use the Word of God because it's the Word of God mixed with faith, the working of the Holy Spirit, and our decision that changes our lives. Yeah. So my final statement is simply this. Let's be known as great Bible preachers and not just preachers. Absolutely. Amen. Yeah. And while I've got the mic, if you're preaching and you're using notes, well, let me just show you. When I do it, I write out the scriptures. I copy and paste, yeah. Yeah. put them in a different color so I know that that's the word of God. Yeah. And that way you're not fumbling trying to find the scripture mm -hmm. because in my Bible pages are really thin mm -hmm. so just a hint amen amen thank you Jerry great Jerry